Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new here, hi my name is Bungie and you are watching True Crime with Bungie. On today's video, we're going to be talking about South Africa's very first serial killer, or at least the very first serial killer on record. But before I get into it, this is where I have to make my disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anybody that I'm going to be talking about in this video and all the families that were and are affected by this case. This video is purely for educational purposes and all the information was gotten off of the internet and simply compiled into one video. And now let's hop right into it. So the guy that we're going to be talking about today was known as the insurance killer, but his name is Pierre Basson. His um, full name is actually Pierre Conil Faculis Basson, but I'm going to be referring to him as either Pierre or Pierre Basson. I'm not going to be saying his whole, like his full name because it's, it's too long. So Pierre Basson was born in 1880 in Claremont, which is in Cape Town, and he was born into what society might call a normal family. Both of his parents were still together, and also he had three siblings. He had two brothers and a sister, and his family life was kind of normal but he wasn't a typical child in fact he was a very violent boy who just enjoyed putting other people in pain and other animals um he liked torturing birds for some reason he would catch birds and then he would torture them to death and i don't know how but i'm assuming that because it's birds he would probably catch them and like pluck their feathers out or maybe strangle them or something I don't know but he tortured birds to death and sometimes he would also catch maybe stray cats or cats belonging to other people and then he would cut off their feet and just watch as they cried in agony until they would eventually die when he was 12 years old he also approached another boy with a knife I'm not sure if he went as far as you know cutting him or like scratching him with the knife or something but Wikipedia does say that he sliced the boy and i just found that a little bit odd because like how did he slice him but also no other website said that he sliced the boy so i'm just gonna say he approached the boy with a knife he was a pretty disturbed and violent kid as you can already tell in his teens pierre also gained a reputation for himself as a petty thief he would steal other people's property it was never property that was of a high value, but it was still other people's property. And if you're like me, everything that you own to you has a certain, you know, amount of value and you don't, you just don't want anybody to, to steal it. But anyways, he gained a reputation for himself as a petty thief. And this kind of created some tension at home because his father was constantly just trying to get him to, you know, leave his ways and just kind of live a straight life. But Pierre was, he was pretty content with the life that he was living. He was okay with it. But of course, because the parents were trying to get him to live a straight life and he wasn't trying to live a straight life, this caused a lot of tension at home. When he was 17 years old, his father passed on due to natural causes. And as the eldest son, Pierre just kind of assumed the role of being the family head he had to take care of his mother his two brothers and his sister and he had to find ways to sustain their livelihood because his father's insurance payout wasn't gonna last them that long but i think it's important to also mention that after his father's death pierre showed little to no concern like he didn't seem like somebody who had just lost a parent he was acting like everything was normal that he hadn't lost a loved one so that was kind of odd to people it was really odd yeah it's it was really odd but anyways because Pierre had to find ways to sustain his family that's when he started getting into insurance fraud his plan was to become a loan shark and then eventually forced the people who still owed him money to make him the sole beneficiary of their life insurance policies and those life insurance policies specifically had to be for unexpected deaths like accidents or something which was also weird so in 1901 Pierre took out life insurance policies for himself his mother and his two brothers Jesper and Johan 
Jesper's life insurance policy was worth £3,500, which was a pretty large sum of money at the time. It still is now if you like convert it to rent. It kind of it kind of is. But anyways, he took out a life insurance policy for Jesper and that was £3,500, which was also the highest amount among like all the other insurance policies for himself, his mother and his other brother. And a couple of months after taking out these life insurance policies, he also let all the other insurance policies lapse, but he kept paying for Jesper's life insurance policy. I think Jesper was the youngest of his two brothers, I'm not sure, but it was kind of weird that he let all the other policies lapse, but he kept Jesper's policy, you know? Anyways, in February of 1903, Jesper and Pierre decided that they wanted to go out as brothers to go bond and stuff, so they decided that they wanted to go to Gordon's Bay for some fishing. Pierre left the day before that and he went to Gordon's Bay and booked himself into the Holloway Hotel. Jesper was going to be coming the following day. When Pierre arrived at the Holloway Hotel, him and the owner of the hotel, Mr. Holloway, started having some conversations. Pierre showed interest in the drowning incidents that had took place there. And Mr. Holloway didn't think much of it. He was answering all the questions that Pierre had, providing him with answers and stuff like that. He told Pierre about a man named Rue who had lost his life at a particular spot known as Rechtefle or something like that. And he also mentioned a particular notorious location known as the Sewing Room Rock where there had been a vicious undercurrent and the victims just vanished without a trace. Pierre asked him if the men had been washed off of a rock and also why their bodies weren't found. And Mr. Holloway didn't have the answers to, this que to these questions so he didn't respond. So Jasper arrives at Gordon's Bay late on the afternoon of the 13th of February 1903 and the two headed out to the river the following morning in the early hours at around like 6.45 or so. That very same morning, two other fishermen, Dr. Ford and Mr. August Dadia, met up with Pierre who was now making his way back to the hotel alone. He told them that there had been an accident and that his brother had drowned. But what shocked the two men was that he was very calm as he was telling them that his brother just drowned. And it's weird, like you don't expect somebody who just witnessed somebody drowning to be that calm, regardless of whether that other person is like somebody they knew or not. You really don't expect somebody to be calm after experiencing such an ordeal you know he said that he was cutting bait when a huge wave swept Jasper off of the rocks and if you remember he asked mr holloway if the men who had been washed off by an undercurrent had been on a rock or something so i guess he was like putting his story together he said that he was cutting bait Jasper was standing on top of a rock and a huge wave came and swept him off of the rock he said that he then heard Jesper crying out for help and he tried to help him but then a second wave came over and washed him into a gully and when he got up he saw Jesper lying in the water face down and then he just vanished like he couldn't see him anymore. This was also a little suspicious to the two fishermen because he said that the only thing that prevented him from helping his brother out was the fact that a huge wave came over and washed him down as well. But he only had one wet pent leg and you'd expect somebody who had just been pushed over by a wave to be a lot wetter than just, you know, like half of your pent leg, one of your pent leg also. It was a little bit suspicious but the two men said okay and Pierre made his way back to the hotel. So an extensive search was conducted for Jasper's body. Pierre and other local fishermen got in a boat and they went out to look for Jasper's body. When they reached Sewing Room Rock, Pierre showed them where he last saw Jasper and they tried to search around that area but there was no sign of Jasper's body. Despite the extensive search, Jasper's body was never found. Soon after this, Pierre went back to Cape Town and then he notified the insurance company of his brother's death. Some rumors had already started going around about Jesper's death and the insurance company refused to give them their payout because they suspected insurance fraud. They suspected that this could be insurance fraud, especially because Jesper's body wasn't 
found. They were not necessarily accusing Pierre of murder, although the rumors were accusing Pierre of murdering his own brother, but they were accusing him of like committing or attempting to commit insurance fraud. So because the insurance company was refusing to give them the money, Pierre asked his mother to take the insurance company to court, which she did, and the judgment was pronounced in their favor. Soon after that, the insurance company did pay them. The family then used the insurance payout money to buy a house called the Arums, which was in Heatherton Road in Claremont. I guess you could say that his success with the insurance company inspired or encouraged him to continue with the scheme because he did go on to kill a number of people for their insurance payouts between the years 1902 and 1905. One man who had ceded his £375 life insurance over to Pierre Basson was found dead on Woodstock Beach. Another one was found drowned while he was sailing out with Pierre. And he was also suspected to be responsible for the death of a man called Adolf Beck whose body was found floating in the Black River. He also met a man called William Schaefer towards the end of 1905. William Schaefer was a German farmer. Pierre would go on to murder William Schaefer and this murder would be what eventually led the police to Pierre. So we're gonna get into the William Schaefer story and how the two met and basically the events that led to William's murder because it is the only story that has been elaborated or spoken about or written about on the internet. So William owned a farm called the Highlands which was situated 25 kilometers from Claremont at the end of Clipfontaine Road and he shared the property with his brother Gottlieb. So William wanted to sell the Highlands and the news that he wanted to sell his farm made its way to Pierre and that's when Pierre started thinking of ways in which he could con or scheme William out of his property. In December of 1905, Pierre made his way to the Highlands to discuss the logistics of the purchase with William. So William told Pierre that he was selling the farm for 1400 but after a lot of bargaining, the two men finally reached an agreement that the price of the farm would be 1020 William also made it clear to Pierre that the legal transfer of ownership would only take place once the full payment had been made. And Pierre was okay with it, or so he said. So from this point, because they had reached an agreement, William Schaefer took Pierre to his attorney, Mr. Herman Hirschberg, to dive more into the legal parts of this transaction. So during this meeting, William also made a provision that the transfer of ownership would only take place in his presence and would not take place without proof of payment. So everybody agreed, they shook on it, and they went their separate ways. A few days after the meeting, Pierre made his way back to Mr. Hirschbeck's office, but this time he was alone. And when he got there, he tried to get Mr. Hirschbeck to transfer the property into his name. Herman refused, telling him that as per the provision of the contract, he couldn't transfer the ownership into Pierre's name, you know, without the proof of payment and also in William's absence. Pierre was disappointed because he didn't get what he wanted, but he definitely wasn't discouraged. He went back to the drawing board and he tried to draw up a new way in which he would get the property to be transferred into his name without actually paying for it. He went back to Herman's office about a week later and told him that he had paid William for the farm and again tried to convince him to transfer the property into his name. Herman refused again because Pierre didn't provide him with any receipt or proof of payment and again William was not around. But he did agree to prepare all the necessary documents and he gave him the drafts of the documents that he would need to present to the board of executors to substantiate his application for a £500 loan. 
I don't know why he needed a loan, but I guess he needed those documents in order to qualify or something for the loan. So early in 1906, Pierre went back to Hirschbeck's office alone, but this time he had a counterfeit receipt for £1,020. Herman Hirschbeck didn't know that the receipt was a counterfeit, but he did tell him that as a formality, he would have to contact Willem because he couldn't make the transfer without talking to William first. Pierre told him not to worry about it and that William was satisfied with everything, he was okay with everything and there would be no need for Herman to contact him. He further went to say that William had gone to Kimberley so it would be impossible for Herman to contact him. At this point Herman was already getting pretty suspicious of Pierre and he stood his ground, refusing to proceed with the transaction until he had spoken to William in person. They had a bit of an exchange and Pierre stormed out of his office. By this point he was already seeing that things weren't going according to plan and he was thinking that the only way that this scheme was gonna work would be if he killed William Schaefer, hid his body and then forged his signature. So he went back to the drawing board again and he started coming up with a plan. He told a laborer called Christian to dig up a large pit in the chicken run in the backyard. When his mother asked him what it was about, he just told her that he was digging the pit up to improve something in the drainage system and she believed him. A week later, the pit was complete and it was now time to initiate the other step in the plan. He then went to get two bags of lime and stored them in the hand coop and then used a fake name to go get some chloroform from a local pharmacist. From there, Operation Kill William Schaefer was in session. On the 22nd of January 1906, William Schaefer got on his horse and trap and made his way to Pierre Basson's home. He stopped at Herbert Hawkins blacksmith shop and asked him to shoe his horses and also make some minor repairs on his carriage. He told him that he would be back in about an hour or two after collecting some money for his farm from Pierre Basson and then he left on foot. When he arrived at Pierre Basson's home, he was welcomed by Pierre and his friend called Tobias Lowe. The three men went into Pierre Basson's room together, but unfortunately, Mr. William Schaefer was never seen again. It is believed that once they were in the room, they offered him a drink and then they somehow overpowered him and then murdered him. They probably used the chloroform to like knock him out before murdering him. They then kept his body inside the house and waited until everybody had gone to sleep before taking him outside to bury him. During this process of burying Mr. Schaefer, a woman called Catherine Mochella happened to be walking by Pierre Basson's home. She heard a suspicious noise and also saw a low light and she thought that somebody might be trying to steal Pierre Basson's chickens and so she decided to move closer to the house and kind of investigate. Through a gap in the wall, she saw what looked like the body of a white man being pushed into a hole. She also heard Pierre instruct Tobias to hand him the lime. And obviously she was alarmed by this, so she just decided to pull herself towards herself and mind her own. She left. She didn't call the police. She didn't inform the police because she was afraid that they would lock her up for prying or, in her words, for nothing we must remember that this was way back in the 1900s this was a very dark time for black people and i'm assuming because she's catherine mochella she was probably a black woman so you know she decided to just keep her mouth shut and continue with her life hawkins on the other side you remember the blacksmith he was also getting worried because william didn't return at the time that he said that he would be back so the next morning he decided to go to the police in Claremont to tell them, you know, what he was worried about and then he went to Pierre Besson's home. When he got there, Pierre's mom told him that she thought that Mr. Schaefer had went to Kimberley. Hawkins obviously thought that it was weird because William made no mention of going to Kimberley when he was at his shop the previous day. It was a little bit odd but 
again it was okay he said okay and he went back to his shop shortly after this Piero went to his shop to collect mr schaefer's horse and trap and he provided him with a receipt and told him that he now owned all of mr schaefer's farm property hawkins was confused by the fact that the receipt was dated the 11th of january but on the 22nd of Jan, when William was at his store, he said that he was going to fetch money for his farm from Pierre Basson. It didn't make much sense that Mr. Schaefer would hand out a receipt without first receiving the full payment. But he couldn't really argue. He said that it was okay and he gave Pierre his property. Within days of Mr. Schaefer's suspicious disappearance, Pierre packed his stuff up and moved into the Highlands. Gottlieb, Mr. Schaefer's brother, protested. He didn't believe that William would just sell the farm and everything on the farm without telling him because they shared the property. But Pierre showed him the receipt and told him that he owned everything and he couldn't really argue with the receipt. But he had nowhere to go so he asked Pierre if he could stay on the farm and Pierre said okay. He could stay for a little while until he found an alternative accommodation. A lot of people who knew William Schaefer knew that it was so unlike him to just disappear without telling anybody anything, especially his brother. But they couldn't really do anything because they didn't know where he was. All they had was Pierre's word. They also approached the police telling them about the suspicious or mysterious disappearance. But the police also couldn't do much because all they had was... Pierre's word, honestly, they didn't know where to look or where to start looking, so they couldn't do much. The newspapers, however, did speculate and they wrote their speculations, like they wrote everything that, you know, they suspected. And on the 7th of February 1906, an article was written about the mysterious disappearance of Mr. William Schaefer. Two days after this article was released, the police made an offer to the public that they would give anybody who could help them solve the mystery a £50 reward. But there was no response until Catherine Mochella decided to write a note to the police. The note read, Go and search Mr. P. Basson Fall Run for the Missing Man. Dig the grown-up Heatherton Avenue for Mr. Schaefer the Missing Man. She waited for a response in the newspapers, but when she didn't get any response, she decided to write back to the police again. And this note read, Sir, this is the whole story of the missing man, Mr. Schaefer. The first notice I sent was for the police to know that the missing man is on the property of Mr. P. Basson. In his fall back under the floor, there is a lot of sand on top, not the hawk, but where they sleep in it's pretty confusing but you can kind of get what she's saying like it's it it kind of makes sense on the 10th of february 1906 pierre Basson had an interview with the local newspaper called the argus in this interview he denied having any involvement with mr schaefer's disappearance he basically said that the only reason why he wanted to do this interview was to clear his name because he was being accused of certain things that he didn't the same day that this interview happened was also the same day that the police received the second note from Miss Catherine Mochella. So after receiving the second note, the police decided that it was high time that they headed over to Mr. Pierre Basson's home to search the hand coop. When they got there, they started digging up at the back just as Mrs. Catherine told them to do. Or Miss Catherine. Pierre was in his bedroom when the police arrived and started digging up. He came out of his bedroom around 10 minutes later and he was met by his brother Johan who told him what the police were up to or what the police were doing. Johan said that there was a look of despair on Pierre's face and he told him that it was all Lowe's fault, all Tobias's fault and that the police were definitely going to find the body and they were going to lock him up and then he stormed back into his bedroom and closed the door. His mother then came into his bedroom a few minutes after that and when she got there, Pierre told her that he was basically innocent and that it was all because of Tobias Slow. He also told her that he would be handing himself over to the police 
you know, he was he was saying that he was going to pack up and he was going to hand himself over to the police. And then he gave her a kiss on the forehead and his mother left the room. But only moments after she had walked out, they heard a shot go out in Pierre Basson's room. It turns out that Pierre had put a gun to his head and shot himself to death. At around 2.45 p.m. that day, William Schaefer's body was found in the backyard of the Arums. His body was badly decomposed because of the lime, but he was still pretty recognizable. Pierre Basson was never tried for his crimes because he committed suicide, but his accomplice, Tobias Lowe, was arrested and charged for the murder of William Schaefer. However, there was insufficient evidence against him and he was therefore acquitted. Following Pierre's death, the family was pretty destitute and so they had to sell the arms and all of its contents. A public auction was held and it attracted many people because this case was popular it was famous because of this fame or notoriety the property was actually sold at a higher price a price that was actually higher quite high like it was higher than what the property was actually worth so this case is pretty similar to, i think it is kind of somehow similar to our boxburg lake murder case and if you haven't watched that one i would suggest that you go watch it right after this one both cases took place way back then but i do think you will see some similarities but that brings us to the end of today's video if you haven't subscribed to my channel already please do and if you enjoyed this video please click on the like button and leave a comment down below to let me know that you watched it and also leave your case suggestions in the comment section down below don't forget to also turn on your post notifications so that you get notified each time i upload a new video and that is it from me i'll see you guys again next week